Get it over with, you son of a bitch. Do you know your own mind? Can you face your own shadow? Do you know that heaven and hell are within you? All the gods, all the monsters, at war in your psyche. That crazy place. The terrors of the night. But there is a light within the darkness. The dark side of human nature. My nature, your nature. Dense, black, foreboding is this shadow that you must meet as first an enemy and then as your brother. As the philosopher Frederick Nietzsche once said, be careful lest in casting out your demons, you cast out the best thing that's in you. We run from the darkness of our minds, looking for the light on a spiritual path. How to slay this ignorance, to understand the psychology of it all. Here's one for all you seekers out there. I'm not saying there's no such thing as enlightenment. What I'm saying is forget about the spiritual quest. I didn't have to come back, and nobody needs to listen. But I have to speak anyway. My brother demands it. The method must be cryptic, irreverent. My brother's voice must come through. You must know his madness, and through knowing him, you may come to know your own forgotten self. Oh brother, where art thou? A seeker is somebody searching for something called spiritual enlightenment. Although we're all seekers in a way. We all want to know the answers to the big questions in life, like why are we here? How did we get here? What is the meaning of life? What happens when we die? And is there some kind of spiritual or mystical dimension that we can experience in this life and beyond? I am here, brother, humble abode, and I welcome you to your own inner space. Always welcome. Yes. You don't need to speak for me. I can speak for the both of us. Always welcome. no caps, I wish silly and no. So let's go back to the beginning and I'll take it from here. Humble abode, how honest can you be with my tongue? Don't confuse anyone. A schizophrenic with a messiah complex is not everybody's favorite guest for tea. Who are they? You didn't have to make your private madness public. Is that what this is about? Once you get on this underground train, you have to go all the way. He, he hasn't, hasn't got, got the nerve. nerve. Yes, yes, he has. I'll let you have the stage. But, but remember, remember, my voice, naked, will come through. What the seeker finds with enough investigation is that answers to those big questions do seem to exist. So what exactly do you experience when you're enlightened? We're told it's kind of like dying to your normal state of consciousness the one you're using right now, and being reborn into a new state of consciousness in which you'd see everything around you, including yourself, as a single, connected organism. It's not a physical death, it's a psychological one. Where there was once multiplicity and separation, now there's oneness. And in this grand state of oneness, you are not you anymore. You are everything and nothing at the same time. You are everything because in oneness, obviously, nothing is separate. And yet, you're nothing at the same time because the biggest realization of all in a state of spiritual awareness is that the material world, even in its oneness, is not actually real. It's all a projection. 
emanating from a vast, incomprehensible void of pure consciousness. And this pure consciousness, they say, unborn and undying, is ultimately what you are. The Hindus call it the dream of Vishnu. The New Age marketplace sells it harder than a travel agent sells the dream holiday. But it's not a dream in the same sense as a nighttime dream. You don't suddenly abandon ethics or morality. It's a dream world characterized by continuity and consequence, and you have to obey the laws by which the dream world operates. Who wouldn't want to experience such a magical realm to feel spiritually liberated, to become immortal? Spirituality, then, to give it a definition, is the quest to undergo this rebirth, this psychological death and resurrection, and live as our true self. Of course, some are skeptical. Of course, some are interested. They're not interested. They hate you. They're seething. You're wasting their time and mine. They want to kill you. Face it, you're just not up to the job. We should have had the cartoon by now. It won't help. Tell them, tell them. So, the spiritual quest usually begins on the intellectual level, because that's the only place you can start from, with enlightenment being presented to the intellect as a transformation of consciousness, where once you were using these two eyes, suddenly, let's say, you're using a third, and your perception of everything changes, except you can't imagine seeing with a spiritual eye any more than a blind man can imagine sight. Now, there are plenty of techniques and practices that aim to take you beyond the intellectual level into a direct experience of that other consciousness. We could get into some of those, but let's not. Why would I say that? And who am I to talk anyway? Who am I? A man can have everything in the world and find it is still not enough. Born into a life of wealth and privilege was such a man. From European aristocracy he came. Educated at the finest schools, he became a worldly man of intellect and culture. Yet always he knew a certain kind of wisdom was lacking. Still, he had the love of a woman. The future held promise. But she, together with his parents, died suddenly in a freak accident. Distraught, and inheriting a family empire he cared little for, he turned his back on a world he found meaningless. He became fascinated by mystical literature. For seven years, he sailed around the world looking for the meaning of life and spiritual enlightenment. Eventually, he could read no more. On a stormy night, far out at sea, he gave up the spiritual quest and threw all his books overboard. Suddenly, a mighty gust of wind took him off his feet and cast him overboard. The raging sea sucked him under. Down he went, as though caught in the jaws of a sea creature. His consciousness gave in. Death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. Psychological death and resurrection. You think I'm here for the limelight, sweetheart, craving fame? When I'm done, this mask comes off. You could walk past me in the supermarket and not even know who I am. It's about the message, baby, not me. No, this, this is, is about you and how you're, you're coming, coming to, terms to terms with, with me. Over here. With this elaborate stunt. You know you can hear me. Looking, Looking over, over your, your shoulder, shoulder. You, wanted you wanted my voice to come, come through. Everywhere. And yet... You, you want, want to hide, hide behind, behind a character. character. I won't let you hide behind a character. And undying is ultimately what you are. I'm just going to freeze here. I can't see the, the um, auto cue with the steady cam going. Okay, it's cut there. Thank you. When did that happen? Just about two minutes ago, I think. Fucking hell. I suppose we're going to not bother with the audience. Um, Reaction mics with all the sort of talk back and forth, I guess. Is, is that right? We need it quiet, really, in case anyone happens to think I'm funny and laughs. Dan, did we get that? <laughs> it's even better. I should carry on like this. No. Challenging you to think about yourself. The concept of the self. What is the self? 
the self that you think you are, your personality, that flimsy manufactured personality of yours? What about the real you, the you you might not have discovered yet? That's the you I'm interested in, the you beneath the you. Do you have a hint of it? Do you have any kind of clue that it's there? A deeper consciousness than the one you operate with? So anyway, I'm just, I'm improvising now. I talk about psychology a lot. I talk about Carl Jung. I don't talk about Sigmund Freud. I mean, he was just a bloody coke addict. Yeah, and a womanizer. And he's so well respected, Sigmund Freud, but I don't get it. Yeah, Joe, can I have the, um... Can you just scroll to anything, Joe? I'm going to do some scripts. Scroll to anything at random. OK, here we go, right? So at some point in the thing, I... I are we rolling? Right. Well, do we have anyone rolling? All right, all right. It's hot film work, isn't it? Jesus, yeah. I mean, you think you've got it hard, Sam? Yeah, seriously. What about me in this bloody suit? All right, I'm, I'm going to do some script. Um, I'm, I'm going to do a, a tiny bit of script. And, you know, Dan, you're in shot. Sorry. Yeah. Now, I'm going to make it really easy for you. I'm going to tell you the only five books you need to get all the benefits of a fully-fledged spiritual quest, including how to jump off the whole merry-go-round when it's time. His consciousness gave in. The next thing he knew, he was lying on the shore of a beach at dawn. An old Japanese fisherman was standing above him. You rescued me, said the man. I thought I caught a big fish <laughs> and found it was you. Something happened to me down there, said the man. Something miraculous. In the depths of the sea, when all had turned black, he saw three luminous rings of light and was pulled into its center. He then came upon a gigantic chamber of light, which had a presence as though alive and conscious. Into this chamber he went, where he finally experienced a moment of spiritual enlightenment. And then back out he came, as though magically transported onto the shore. He explained all this to the fisherman, including his past, his spiritual seeking, and all his years at sea. Now go home and tell people, said the fisherman. I'm not going back, said the man. That experience cannot be put into words anyway. You will go back, I am sure, said the fisherman. The way forward will present itself. But the man was not so sure. His family legacy and identity were too well known. If people hadn't already considered him an eccentric rich man, they certainly would now. This too is yours, said the fisherman, handing over a sword. It was floating beside you. It's not mine, said the man. With you it stays. I catch fish with hook and net, not blade. And with that, the fisherman took the man back to his yacht, refusing any reward. Back on deck, the man found a parcel with a note attached to it. It was an invitation to a masquerade ball that evening on one of the other yachts. Upon arriving, he was intrigued to find a debate underway about spirituality. After a drink or two, he let rip of the pompous windbags who had no idea what they were talking about. He was downright rude, provocative, but entertaining. The crowd loved it. They gathered round him, wanting to hear more. At the end of the night, a thought suddenly struck him. Here was a guise under which he could go back and share his experience, an alter ego, a brash character he could play and remain anonymous at the same time. Yes, you're quite a character. All this for me. You'll go bust. You're really steering the ship, aren't you, schizo? The joy of madness. Who are you? 
¿Dónde está la niña? All this for me. All right, carrying on. Is everything all right with the cameras? Yeah, okay. Oh, where the fuck was I? Um, so I've got what I call the five book solution. And I'll whiz right through it. You don't even need to read any of these books. The basic idea is all you need for the purposes of the exercise here. The first book in the five book solution is The Golden Bow, written in 1890 by the anthropologist James Fraser. An anthropologist is someone who studies how mankind has developed as a species in terms of our behaviour and social practices. We start with The Golden Bough because it was the first book of its kind to really look at the origins of religion. With The Golden Bough, you come to realise that every religion is basically a recycling of much older beliefs, rituals and customs, and that religion today would not exist without them. As you read the book, you begin to understand that the idea of a saviour dying for the good of his people, for example, is a very old idea, timeless in fact, and something that was literally acted out in ancient times. The death of a sacrificial victim was seen to guarantee the resurrection of nature's power, power that fluctuated with the changing of the seasons, power that had to be renewed annually and paid for in human blood. It was a universal belief in a worldwide ritual, for a while, nature would accept only the king himself as a sacrifice, so thought the primitive mind. And when the time came, these kings went to their sacrificial slaughter like a bridegroom to the bride, willingly, happily, with the fullest sense of duty and participation in some higher order. In later times, when the king's reign was considered more practical to maintain than cut short, the tribal community would select a random person to play the role of king for a day. Usually a passerby would be snatched or else a criminal would be selected for the honour. It was also considered possible for illnesses, evil spirits and any shameful past conduct to be transferred to the sacrificial victim as well. So that not only would he serve as an offering to various nature gods, but would carry away all the local diseases and bad vibes too. With the passage of time, when the ritual murder of strangers and criminals began to look a tad uncivilised, they decided to use dummies. The dummies were paraded around the village or town before being disposed of in a socially acceptable manner which the community could gather around and celebrate. A popular method was to simply throw the dummy on a bonfire. The charred embers of the bonfire were then scattered over the cornfields or such like, in line with the sacrificial act promoting the regeneration of nature's power. It's become more common these days to just have a bonfire, usually with fireworks and not bother with a dummy, although the meaning of the ritual has been lost. The book traces all kinds of common customs back to their primitive roots to reveal the superstitions behind them and how many of them have transformed over time into the religious rituals we see today. You don't have to look very far to see how the idea of a saviour dying for the good of his people is still very much alive today. Since a psychological death and resurrection is the goal of the spiritual quest, this book is ideal to start you off down that road by acquainting your mind very closely and vividly with that cycle. The cycle. What sacrifice? Can I have some water, please, Peter. Thanks. Do you really Do you think, think they, they care about, about the cycle? cycle? Thank you very much. Who's, Who's the, the dummy? dummy? Look, Look at, at them. them. You or me? Bored. Confused. I warned you about that. You're doing splendidly. Make them laugh. Don't you listen? They're laughing anyway. Except. You can't, you can't hear it. it. Don't, Don't you listen? listen? The Golden Bough ought to be read in schools and taught the same way Darwinism is taught, so that we understand not just where we came from organically as a species, but how we've developed mentally too. <laughs> Isn't he cute? Just like our little sheepdog. <laughs> past my head there, that's gonna be on shot. Okay, let's go back, back, Joe. That night, he suffered a terrible nightmare, which seemed so real, he thought it might actually be happening. The boat started rocking violently, as though shaken from below. Through the cabin windows, he saw strange figures climbing over onto the deck. With no time to lose, he found the sword. He swung wildly, taking the heads off many before the rest vanished into the night. He had not been afraid. With the sword and the mask, he had felt transformed, 
a match for any terror. He felt more certain than ever that it was time to return and make use of everything he had experienced. He bought a disused military airfield and set about converting its biggest aircraft hangar into a unique performance space in which he recreated the Chamber of Light. Local interest grew in this strange private man, a man who kept to himself, whom no one could claim to have seen, whose name and background was not known. The public were invited to come and hear him speak. He was ready for them now. <laughs> the second book of the Five Book Solution is Joseph Campbell's masterpiece, published in 1949, called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. In the same way that Fraser discovered a common universal theme running through all the rituals of mankind, so too did Campbell discover universal themes running through world mythology as well. That across all the cultures of the world, no matter how separated they were by time or space, the same myths legends and folk tales were being handed down from one generation to the next, with basically the same hero character following the same basic adventure with the same basic outcome. These common characters and stories came to be known as archetypes. An archetype, to put it simply, is something common that's found in storytelling everywhere. And what the archetypes found in mythology suggest is that the human race seems to operate from a common psyche, a single mind, what the Swiss psychologist Carl Jung called the collective unconscious. This isn't to say we don't have our own personal mind with thoughts and features unique to each and every one of us. On the surface of it, we do. That's where we find the ego, your conscious awareness on the surface of the mind. But deep, deep down below the personal conscious self-biographical ego level is a very deep abyss, fathomless and mysterious, which is not personal. This is the common psyche, the single mind, the collective unconscious. This is where that much fabled, much desired transformation of consciousness occurs. It's down there where the ego descends, dies and is reborn. It's no easy place to reach. It's as though you're going into deep, dreamless sleep, awake. What's down there is conscious. You're just not conscious of it on the ego level. It's pure consciousness itself. And if you can experience it consciously, it purifies. None of this means your personal mind doesn't have its own unconscious area as well, uniquely yours, where various repressed or forgotten memories might lurk. But that's your subconscious, not the collective unconscious. Carl Jung calls the personal unconscious or subconscious the shadow, and we all have one. The subconscious is not just a basket that you throw all your unwanted memories into. It's alert and active at all times, but its nature is volatile. It doesn't process incoming data the way consciousness does. Everything gets mashed up and becomes unintelligible, and it takes on a life of its own. Dreams and nightmares give you a glimpse into its erratic, independent nature. That rambling chaos is going on all the time, day and night, but you don't actually know it. It occupies a blind spot, but you feel it in everything that's conflicted and uncontrollable in you. It generates all sorts of fears and anxieties that can frustrate your dreams and relationships. It varies from person to person how dominant their shadow is, and it can swing from being active to passive at any given moment. But it's there in everyone, a law unto itself. From the shadow comes the most resistance to the psychological death and rebirth. It has to be confronted. Campbell discovered that mythology was talking in a symbolic way about something that every story had a meaning and that you weren't meant to take the stories literally, but to understand them as metaphorical, which means there's a double meaning. He saw very clearly how the hero's journey is symbolic of a psychological death and rebirth, where the departure of the hero, his trials and finally his triumph, is symbolic of achieving something within. Whether it's David slaying Goliath, George killing the dragon, Beowulf battling Grendel, or Saint Michael trouncing Lucifer, the variations are endless, but all refer symbolically to the same thing. 
What's achieved is victory over the shadow. The days and weeks passed as I sailed back, but still I had no idea how I would talk about what I had discovered within. And then the strangest thing happened. I thought all my books were lost, but five of them appeared to have followed me. Maybe there was a way, after all, if I could just think of a way to make use of them. It can be a revelation when you discover that mythology, all those legends and folktales, are entirely spiritual and psychological in their meaning. They're not just silly stories made up a long time ago. They're talking about you and your spiritual potential. The storyteller is always the best vehicle for this and symbolism always the best language. Standing up here talking about it is almost a waste of time because ultimately we're talking about something that cannot be talked about, an experience that goes beyond intellectual contemplation. In fact, by the time I'm done, if I haven't succeeded in mixing some kind of fictional, mythical dimension into all this, I've probably done the whole thing a big disservice. When you combine Joseph Campbell with Carl Jung, you learn how to extract the true meaning behind any mythic story or religious fable. You realize we don't need to throw religion away just because it makes no sense when taken literally. Just understand it symbolically and it speaks to you. Obviously there is no talking snake, for example, but that snake is symbolic of something. A snake sheds its skin to live anew as you must shed your shadow to do likewise. The biblical end of the world scenario is not the end of the physical world. It's a personal psychological event, not a global catastrophe. It's the end of one state of mind and the beginning of a new one. Book number three, of which I need say no more, is Carl Jung's Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious. Saying all that, if any Christian can show me a talking snake, I'll convert immediately and get the fucking thing out on tour. That's more like it. Bring out the dark side. Brutal. Don't just talk about me. Be. Me. Rude. Without shame or judgment. Shameless. Or any of that intellectual posturing. Irredeemable. Just. Be. Me. Honest. Do you hear something? No, not me, you silly bastard. I mean, do you hear something? In your own goddamn head? No, of course you don't. Hey! That's the shadow for you, baby. The shadow wants to run riot and terrorize your psyche, and it does. You think not? You think there isn't a fine line between madness and sanity? Ha <laughs> ha! I know Christians won't like any of this, but that's okay. They're hardly going to beat me up. You can really take liberties with Christians these days. A few hundred years ago, they were burning people at the stake. Today, they're busy baking cakes in Sunday school and organizing summer camps for kids who will grow up to hate them. If any Christian has a problem with me, basically, I'll knock them out. But I wouldn't dare poke fun at the Jews or Arabs. In fact, I love Jews and Arabs. I love Arabs because I quite fancy a trip to Morocco at some point, and I'd like to clear customs without getting fisted. <laughs> and I love Jews because I like having a bank account. I hear that Jews run the international banking system, so what? I don't want to put my cash under a mattress, you understand me? Talking of minorities, I haven't come across any black mystics, have you? You'd think a smart brother somewhere would have realized the gap in the marketplace by now. All we get are God-fearing gospel preachers and Desmond Tutu. How the fuck did the brothers give us soul music when they can't even manage a single fucking guru? Of course, some people will tell you that Jesus was black, but doesn't that make God black too? Let's give that some thought. Mary, the mother of Christ, got pregnant by an absent father who never wore a condom. Does that sound like a black man to you? But it's the hardcore spiritual seekers I'm really fucking with. The new age mob and their gurus. You think you've worked on your ego? You don't know the first thing about it. A lot of seekers turn into spiritual junkies hooked on the feel-good factor of weekend workshops and group hugs. Fuck that. Look how easily I can come through him. Effortless. He likes me. So cooperative. He enjoys me. A pleasure to work with. He is going slowly 
man. And you can go to the doctor and you can take your goddamn pills. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, it ain't gonna do jack shit. That's why I'm here, instead of getting the two for one special at a whorehouse in Okinawa. I'm keeping it simple. You want to hear words like perspicacious and paradigm? Look somewhere else. I don't do guru. But I do have fun watching them. Especially a guy named Eckhart Tolle. You might have heard of him. A little German gnome working the lecture circuit. He wrote a best-selling book called The Power of Now. This guy really plays the part. You must let go of the pain body. That's his catchphrase. And then he starts laughing like a five-year-old girl. Although he does have a wonderful range of knitwear, makes him look all soft and cuddly. Don't even get me started on Deepak Chopra. Maybe you've heard of him. He's another career guru with a publishing deal and a polished act. He's not as kooky as Eckhart. I love that word, kooky. Eckhart's got that whole spaced out ethereal thing down to an art, and that's his act. But Chopra's act is far more statesmanlike. He strides on stage like an Indian prince, shoulders back. Body language scientifically figured out. He's a joy to watch. The technique is like watching an athlete in full flood. Deepak's had an easy ride, though, because he's already got that Indian heritage. His accent is so fucking guru. These gurus are what I call crisis creators. They start by telling you something's wrong or missing in your life, which they can help you fix, of course. They've read all the books, they've done their homework, and now they're peddling spirituality like home insurance. You don't need any of these modern-day pretenders. If they were worth their salt, they wouldn't even try to play the guru game. They'd simply say, you know what, here's a bunch of books by the old timers. It's all you really need, you don't need me. They don't want your third eye open. They want repeat business. Am I pissing them off saying all this? If they're so enlightened, they'll be above it all. It's funny when you see these Western spiritual teachers prancing around like they just fell off a catwalk in Mumbai. Put a fucking suit on, this is how we dress up over here. I spent a lot of time picking out the waistcoat. It had to be a certain shade of white, the colour of dynamic ejaculation. Not that lifeless drizzle your husband gives his mistress. Oh, he's really out there now. He's mine, beyond any decent restraint. Lost in a world of his own. He's not coming back. Effortless, straddling the razor's edge. He's been out there for a very long time. It is so easy to do this to you. Just understand it symbolically. Symbolically.
So, the first three books of the Five Book Solution invite you to consider that there is such a thing as a spiritual dimension and that it's not some vague, whimsical realm, but a labyrinth of the psyche, guarded by a minotaur, more the realm of the gifted psychologist than some clergyman or tarot card reader. And you can't take it lightly. The real spiritual quest isn't about a warm, fuzzy feeling with friends in the forest. It's the deconstruction of your mind, and it's horrifying. If the transformation happens, it's not just your conscious mind being transformed. It's the subconscious as well. The shadow is given consciousness, whereas before it had been merely subconscious, semi-conscious. Its volatile nature owed itself to not having the oxygen of consciousness, so to speak, to give it any stability or purpose. But once filled with consciousness, all that unsettled mental energy becomes stable and available to the conscious mind, where it can now function instead of malfunction. You haven't really killed anything, and that's just the symbolism. What you've done is integrated your subconscious. So, so that's, that's what, what you're, you're doing. doing. Integrating, integrating me. Cutting, cutting out my tongue. You fucking savage. Look, Look at, at the, the way, way you've, you've baffled, baffled that, that poor creature. creature. And for, for God's, God's sake, sake, man, one, one of them, them is sleeping. Is do you, you think, think it's that easy to show me off like, like the, the severed head, head of a fucking animal? animal? Give up. Where's, Where's my, my respect? respect? You get your balls from me. Fuck, Fuck those books and your silly story, pseudo-intellectual. Pseudo Nobody gets it. Wake, wake them up. Put, put them all to sleep. sleep. A, a fucking aircraft hangar? Bring on the whore. You flop. Your symbols for me are a fucking monstrosity. How dare you? Thunder lightning Thunder lightning Thunder
why the antagonistic shadow in the first place? Why can't we all just be enlightened from birth with a fully integrated psyche and stay that way? The spiritual path is full of questions like that especially from seekers who've been on it for a while, who aren't getting anywhere, frustration begins to creep in. The bitching and whining starts. Suddenly they're kicking their yoga mats and cursing under their breath. Fuck the Himalayas. What kind of cosmic dream is this anyway? Well, just look at the cosmos and you get the answer. The universe is made up of chaos and creation. We know that. But those energies coexist and depend on each other. The two function as one in perfect harmony. The forces of chaos and creation are in the psyche as well, but they do not function as one harmoniously unless you integrate the chaotic energy of the subconscious shadow with the creative energy of the conscious mind. There's nothing good or evil about it. Nobody's to blame. These are simply the energies in play in the universe and in us. Maybe those early kings went happily to their sacrifice because they'd already undergone the psychological death and resurrection and knew they weren't being killed at all. Perhaps criminals were made to substitute for kings later on because those kings hadn't undergone the transformation of consciousness and thought they really were facing the end. Was it the spiritual symbolism of the sacrifice that those ancient tribes were relating to in a hazy, intuitive way? All that. By now, my brother's voice would have come through, and there's nothing I could have done to stop it. Like he says, you really shouldn't hide behind a story, but we all wear masks. Sometimes I hear it like it's a radio in my head, like I'm tuning in and out without having my hand on the dial. It's never scared me. It feels quite natural, really. And I understand it for what it is. But it's not the only voice that comes through. It's like I have a giant radar and sometimes I pick up a signal that's much stronger, driving me to listen to my heart and not just my darkness, to follow my dreams, my creative inspirations, no matter how bizarre the final outcome may appear. If you're going to get nowhere in life, get there proud. I suppose that would be the ego talking. I don't have a problem with that, either. It's important here not to confuse the word ego with arrogance. The word ego refers to your sense of individuality, your personal sense of self, distinct from everyone else. And that's the ego in its basic sense. Because the ego rests on this sense of being a separate subject, spiritual seekers are always trying to kill the ego, thinking that's the way to break through into the realm of spiritual oneness and become the perfect human being. No, the ego has to be involved, not sidelined. Remember, think of pure consciousness as a dreamer, dreaming the world and you along with it. It's in your dreams, your goals and ambitions, where you connect to your own essence and true self. There's a dream in you, which is the one overwhelming thing that the dreamer itself is pushing you to do. And I'm not talking about meaningless fantasies. I'm talking about the vision you have for your life. What is your ego's biggest dream? Follow your dreams. Don't let anyone throw you off. That's the message for everyone whether you give a shit about spirituality or not. And so I did follow my dreams, as you can see, whether it made sense or not. I even got so caught up in the whole thing that I forgot to wear the mask in one scene. You'd think one of the crew would have said something, but it was late in the day and we were all tired. And I did 20 minutes of that chunky dialogue with none of us realizing that the vacuum cleaner was on stage. And every now and then there was a pesky fly that wouldn't leave me alone, breaking the flow, spoiling the shot. It was determined to be in the movie. As you can see, he got his way. That's what persistence can do for you. 
You will have noticed I've muted my brother for the time being. He was starting to get out of line and can get much worse. There were times when he was all over me on the stage. I know you think you're a pretty hot shit, but let me tell you something. But that I couldn't help. He knows what's coming. If you don't have a dream, stay open to it. One can grab you any time. If not, try to fall in love instead. That's another sweet little gateway to paradise. I'll come on to that later. Naturally, science thinks it has all the answers. Quantum physics is especially proud of itself at the moment because it thinks it's finally bridged the gap between science and spirituality. And given how quantum physics appears to echo the mystical teaching that the material world is nothing but an illusion. The quantum physicist says that material reality is based on a number of atoms stabilizing when you happen to look at something. It's a nice, easy concept to understand, proven by experiment, no less. If you're not looking at the moon, it's not there. It boggles the mind. But it's true. The New Age mob creamed their loins at the prospect of what you might call quantum mysticism. And so did the quantum mystics, who sold a shitload of books on the subject. But no matter how deep into the atom we penetrate, it can only reveal yet another layer of the projection emanating from the scientifically untouchable mystery of pure consciousness. Who, who even talks, talks like, like that? Let, Let me, me hear, hear it, it again. again. From the scientifically untouchable mystery of pure consciousness. You think you can shut me up? You think you run the show? Delusional. You want my balls? I'll make you eat them first, you scum-sucking pig. You can't hide behind that mask. I'll show them what we are. I want you to get ugly. Are there no adventurous neuroscientists trying to find it? Yes. Are they getting anywhere? Get no. ugly. Ugly. So we'll come back Ugly. to them in about 50 years. It won't be me doing the questioning, of course. It'll probably be some bastard child of mine. <laughs> some kid I never knew I had who wants to go one better than daddy. So, so easy. You go, Junior. I'll be looking up at you from hell where all those pissed off religious fundamentalists are gonna send me when I show up at heaven saying, open the fucking gates, I need a shit. You, you fucking, fucking puppet. puppet. Failure, Failure, porky. porky. Bring, Bring it on. on. Boxing, Boxing ring, ring, parking, parking lot, lot, open, open field, field, rooftop, rooftop your, mother's your mother's garden. garden. So I have what I call the three rings of the psyche. The outer rim of ego consciousness, a sphere within that of the subconscious shadow, and the inner circle of pure consciousness, which we can also call the collective unconscious. Some people settle for the idea that all you need to do is become detached from the contents of your mind to stop identifying with your thoughts and identify with awareness itself, except you can only stop identifying with what you're conscious of. The shadow is something you're not conscious of. Ultimately, it doesn't matter how detached you are from your thoughts. The chaos of the subconscious carries on regardless. So do not hate your shadow. As with your ego, it too has something to give. Although it doesn't feel that way if you happen to suffer from schizophrenia or multiple personality disorder. <laughs> in those cases, the shadow has broken through into consciousness in a way where it's still volatile and not yet being integrated. Just don't go calling a modern day exorcist. They're not working with a psychological scalpel or even a spiritual one. They're a bunch of medieval back alley butchers. You want those demons integrated, not amputated. No, thank you. Why don't you come down here and live with me instead? I have lots of different heads I can try on for you. So now I'm a demon. There's no room for negotiation. I was keeping myself together. You're making it worse for yourself. That wasn't good enough. Don't bother with the end. I want you now. Don't Book four takes us into fictional waters. It's called Heart of Darkness, written by Joseph Conrad, first published in 1902. The book was actually done much better as a film called Apocalypse Now, made in 1979 by Francis Coppola. The book is about a 19th century English sea captain sent to locate and bring back a rogue ivory trader hiding out somewhere in the African jungle. In the film, we follow a mentally unstable army captain in the Vietnam War 
who's sent on a mission to assassinate a rogue colonel who's abandoned the military and set up camp somewhere in Cambodia. The name of the renegade in both versions is Kurtz. In both versions, the captain must take a boat trip down a long river, deep into the jungle, where he must confront Kurtz and terminate his command. I was putting on a good front for you. You're way ahead of me with the symbolism, right? Schizo. Kurtz is the shadow side of the conscious mind, and the captain is going into the heart of the shadow's darkness to deal with it. Traitor. Heart of Darkness makes it onto the list because it demonstrates how art and literature, and more recently the cinema, has become the new mythology where the archetypal heroes and symbols have found new channels to communicate their timeless universal message. We're drawn to these stories even when we don't understand what they're saying about our spiritual condition. Uh, the apocalypse of Coppola's film is not the end of anything. The word apocalypse doesn't even mean the end, as you might think from the word apocalyptic. Apocalypse actually means revelation, the revealing of something. What's revealed when the shadow is neutralized is the revelation of your true self, your pure consciousness. Is your apocalypse to be now or never? This is why villains are so essential to any story and why they usually wear black. They represent the shadow, which you have to confront, just as the hero does in the final showdown. We know these villains represent something important. That's why they're often the most compelling character. Think of the Joker, for example, or Darth Vader. What about Norman Bates or Hannibal Lecter? And then there's Lucifer himself, the ultimate mythic villain. And I'm sure some of you quite fancy that. I'll take on the shadow, what's the big deal? You get a taste of Carl Jung and now you're a thrill seeker. Diving into your subconscious is just like bungee jumping, right? Bring it on. I'm making a fairly passionate case for spirituality after all. How can I say don't bother? We have an exclusive conversation with the best-selling author of His Dark Materials, Book Times Trilogy. of London, calls his writing courageous and dangerous. Mm. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Philip Pullman. He was, and he was an inspiration in many other ways than just Paradise Lost, but it was Paradise Lost for me that, that, that started it. And it's um, remained with me ever since, not only because of the language of that poem, but because of the theme as well, what the poem's about. It tells the story of Adam and Eve, of course, and the temptation. Right. And that really is the story that I'm telling in His Dark Materials, with um, Lyra as Eve, if you like. That there is a parallel, isn't there? She's reaching out for knowledge in the same way that Eve reached for the, the apple on the tree of yes. uh, uh, the knowledge. Yes, the tree, of, tree of knowledge, because, uh, and the interesting thing that people sometimes forget is that Eve was tempted not by, not because the fruit was delicious, because she wanted a, you know, a nice juicy apple, or because it was uh, to do with sex or anything, she was tempted by curiosity. Eat this and you shall become as gods, knowing good and evil, says the serpent. Mm. So it was curiosity that, 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 that tempted her. And I just took that and, and, and said, well, what's, what's so wrong about curiosity? Isn't it a good thing to want knowledge? Isn't it a good thing to want to become wise? I'm finishing with an Eastern classic called the Bhagavad Gita. Or as they'd say in New York, the fucking Gita! Hey, Vito, you read the fucking Gita? Freak. The Bhagavad Gita is a sacred Hindu scripture written sometime between the 5th and 2nd centuries BC, we're told. It's basically a conversation between an Indian prince named Arjuna and his spiritual advisor, Krishna, that takes place on a battlefield just before the battle is about to commence. The moral dilemma of killing has overtaken Arjuna and he's not sure he can lead the charge. It's a mythical story. In it, Krishna is said to be an incarnation of one of the Hindu gods and therefore in possession of divine knowledge. He tells the troubled prince the opposing army has already met its fate with death, that it's not Arjuna doing the killing, it's the will of the universe. Arjuna is made to see himself as an actor in this epic spectacle, who's given a script, costume and character to play by a director who dictates the whole show, regardless of what you think about it. Buddhism has a famous saying that goes, if you see a Buddha in the street, kill him. They're talking about the illusion you're being fooled by. You're meant to kill your own ignorance, not harm some cute little Buddhist monk. For me, there's a double meaning to killing Buddha. What you really have to do is kill the spiritual quest itself, realizing that liberation isn't even in your hands to begin with. Scholars and thinkers have had a hard time with the Gita because what's it saying about war and nutcases like Pol Pot? Pol Pot used to run Cambodia. 
In the 1970s, he wiped out 25% of his population. Now, that's a shadow for you. There was a film about it called The Killing Fields. You might have seen it. It's a tough night's viewing. They couldn't manage a single fucking joke anywhere. <laughs> it needs a remake with a lighter touch. Maybe a pop song at the end. With your third eye open, you'd have a very different view. Oh, you might still pick sides in a war or take up a protest. Spiritual vision doesn't stop you caring about how the dream narrative unfolds. It's similar to how you get drawn into a movie and root for a certain outcome. You're in harmony with the chaos and creation of the universe once those forces have been harmonised and integrated within you. Wherever that harmony doesn't exist, you see it for what it is, and there is no judgement or condemnation anymore. Only compassion. You realise nobody needs to change the world, and that you can't change it anyway. To change the world, you'd have to change the fundamental laws of the universe. All you can change is yourself. The world isn't a problem after that. Whenever someone undergoes that psychological death and resurrection, it does actually affect the material world, because you are no longer the same you within it. Instead, you become an enhanced, spiritualized presence, and this does affect everyone and everything around you. In the same way as the scent of a garden is changed by the opening of a flower, so too is the visible world influenced by each individual metamorphosis of consciousness. It's no coincidence that Hinduism calls that metamorphosis the opening of the thousand-petaled lotus. There's a story about a Western seeker who goes to Japan to hear a Zen monk give a lecture. And during the question and answer period, he stood up and asked, what is the meaning of life? And the Zen monk simply held up a flower. If nobody needs to change the world, why am I saying all this? I have my reasons. If you haven't figured them out by now, you will by the end. Oh, you'd, you'd like, like another, another contribution, contribution from, from me, would you? Would you? Even, Even though, though you're, you're planning, planning to eat my heart. Piss off. The Gita is the perfect book to finish on because it calls you to an understanding of the need for submission, to surrender to the mystery that's been pulling the strings all along. We're coming off the merry-go-round now. If anything, giving up the quest for enlightenment is the best way to bring it about. You see, the conscious mind on its own is no match for the shadow. It's the shadow that has an impact on the conscious mind, not the other way around. But the shadow has no impact on the collective unconscious. When you come off the spiritual quest and surrender to the mystery of not knowing what to do, the power of the collective unconscious can play a much larger role in your psyche in its fight against the shadow. That's what all the heroes and saviors have ultimately symbolized, the power of the collective unconscious. You don't need to know how it works. Let it be mysterious. Surrendering to the mystery doesn't mean you do nothing. All you have to do is listen. Are you listening to what the mystery wants you to submit to, the dream within that wants to be lived? Are you listening when something else comes knocking, something called love? I said we'd get to love, and here we are giving it the last word and final bow, and rightly so. The Bhagavad Gita talks about submission, but in love, you don't need to be told. Surrender is automatic. Love is an overpowering force. And like the non-discriminatory presence of pure consciousness that lives in everyone, no matter who they are, love is also non-discriminatory in whom it touches. Criminals and murderers can fall in love as much as anyone else. But we know there's another side to love. The shadow can still run riot even when the conscious mind has been pacified somewhat by the flight of Cupid's arrow. Love can get damaged or can simply fade over time, wilting like a flower. We can lose the ones we love and all seems lost. How is a love so fragile synonymous with the indestructible force of pure consciousness? Well, it's not love that's ever lost. It's our experience of it that comes and goes. Love is always there. There's no one you can lose that means love itself has left the world altogether. There's nothing you can do that is so bad that love will never arise in your heart again. There's nothing you can do that is so bad that nobody could ever love you again. Love never dies. In this way, love really does seem to reflect pure consciousness as a temporal aspect of the eternal. It really is the best shot at Nirvana you have. Take it. I'll, I'll speak, speak when, when I'm, I'm ready. ready. You, you don't, don't lead me around like a, like a fucking, fucking pony. Screw love. So, so that's, that's your, your big, big message. message.
is it? I thought I was the star of this fucking show. Let me finish this sorry fucking film. You think I'm afraid of your silly fucking concepts, archetypes? You're no hero. This film isn't going anywhere. Have another drink. All that rehearsing. For nothing. They prefer me to you anyway. You're soft. Am I softening too much? Did you prefer the hard stuff? I'm just playing my part too. You see, I have some unfinished business to take care of with my own shadow. I have been down to the collective unconscious, but I didn't go far enough into that chamber of light to get reborn. But I'm ready now for the mystery to take over, which marks the end of my spiritual quest. Thank you for being here. Now, now just, just hold, hold on a minute. minute. Let's talk about this. Let's, Let's go, go back, back a bit like we did at the beginning. beginning. We, we can, can be reasonable. We don't want to do this. We can carry on like before. before. I don't I need oxygen. oxygen. I'm, I'm fine. I'm your friend. I can, I can always, always talk, talk quieter. quieter. I'm your friend. I don't, I don't have, have to talk, talk at all. all. Yes, I do. Or I can, or I can choose, choose a different, different voice. voice. You know how many I've got. Would you like me to sound like the computer from 2001 A Space Odyssey? You know how much you love Kubrick. I'm your friend. You're not listening. Are you listening? I know you can hear me. Let him do it. You told him to do it. No, I didn't. You did. Drive him mad. Do it now. You're not listening. Separated at birth. Change the ending. There's still time. Do it now. I know you can hear me. I won't give you a second chance. I know you're afraid. Does your mother know? I'm afraid. I didn't want to be born. You left me behind. It's too late now. No. Apocalypse. I frightened you off once. You're not listening. I can do it again. Don't do it, you son of a... Thank you for being here. Now disappear. Burn your books and desecrate your idols. In the final analysis, you must follow your dreams and live for love. And everything else must go! And so, he dismantled the Chamber of Light and so the airfield, leaving as mysteriously as he came. He developed a passion for art. His imagination ablaze with the memories of all those mythical figures who had besieged his psyche. He gave a storyline to all those encounters he had faced within himself to create a mythology of his own, portraying a superhero not of the material world, but of the psyche. Fighting villains nowhere else but in the mind, where the real battle is fought. That's probably as much as I can get out. Do I still hear, my brother? That's between me and him. How much of this was fact versus fiction? It was all fact. And it was all fiction. But what's more real than anything was always clear. If you can find love and follow your dreams, then you really have done well. That's about as spiritual as you need to be. Love never dies, giving it the last word and final bow, and rightly so. Love is always there. Take it. Turn off the lights or close your eyes. I have something to talk about that never dies. Something commanding complete attention. Put everything else on full suspension. I was once a pilgrim and one of faith in rituals and beliefs that kept me chaste. I once thought God had the key to eternity until I discovered another fraternity of simple folk who found in their hearts that they were more than the sum of their parts. Nothing more did they need than the hand of another, a soulmate, best friend, and beautiful lover. Hear love's chorus and let it sing. 
Ride upon its mighty wing. Let the planets vanish from view, for there is only me and you. Stars could burst like fireworks in space and disappear without a trace. The earth could even break apart and not even stir our gentle hearts. The oceans could simply drain away and still we would cherish each single day. Hell could rise and burn our flesh, would make the devil himself a welcome guest. Yet love may have its fits and spurts. It's not love until it hurts. Let's battle through the woeful times. Remember that it wants to shine. In this world, some do forget. Taking love for granted invites regret. Our sweet little gateway to paradise cannot be bought, but it's worth any price. My ears turn deaf to the loudest cynic. You hear more sense in a mental clinic. Love is the answer, the meaning, the truth. You learn this with age, if you miss it in youth. Now turn on the lights and open your eyes. Embrace this miracle which never dies. This I can say with no indecision. God is love, and love is my religion.